Okay, so uh, welcome students. I hope, uh, Kishori, this recording is on the cloud. Yes. Okay, uh, welcome students. We are um, now starting our class. So there are a few announcements to make. And first of all, uh, I want to go through the syllabus, what we are going to cover today. So let me share my screen with you, actually, and then I'll show you. Share screen. So, okay. So the topics I'm going to cover here is random variables today, expectation, variance of random and variance of random variables, correlations and covariance of dis distributions, probability distributions, normal or Gaussian density distributions, central limit theorem, convergence of distribution, optimization of functions with multiple variables, linear models, derivation of least square methods, a little bit of linear algebra and its relation to geometry, and then bivariate and multivariate normal distributions. So as usual, we do theory and you know, a hands-on experience at the same time. So let me now switch back to the board. Uh, <clears throat> Great. So, uh, Neil, how is the voice? Can you hear me well? Yes, it's it's Great. it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So last time there was an interesting question. So the question was that why can I not write a program that solves everything? We talked about data being unstructured. For example, if you are working for Facebook or LinkedIn, then you get data, some are pictures, some are chats, some have more chats, some has fewer chats. These are called unstructured data as opposed to tabular data that are in like Excel sheets. You have like a tables, you have rows and columns. Those are tabular data. So why don't we do any API? Somebody was asking me that, why don't you write API that I can actually read unstructured data? So I will start with a quote that I saw in the book called R for Data Science. And it's interesting actually. So in chapter nine and the top they write, it's about tabular data, what kind of data? So they say, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, Leo Tolstoy. So in that, they're saying that tidy data sets, that means tabular data sets are all alike. But every messy data set, which is unstructured, is messy in its own way by the author of physics. So that means there are too many variations that things can be unstructured. Although we say it's structured, unstructured, it's very hard to define what is unstructured. One way to say is that anything that is not structured is unstructured. And there are too many ways things can be unstructured. That's why you don't have an API that deals with unstructured data. So that is one question discussion we had. Um, I want to show something Somia asked, I think. It's about, what about those plots I showed? Two-dimensional plots, what about three-dimensional? And I want to give you an example why three-dimensional plots are not used and it's not very effective. Let me share my screen. <coughs> Here, here I'm using some Python code to make a three-dimensional plot. Not only that, I have made that three-dimensional plot very interactive, see? These are the points in three-dimensional space. It's very hard, every point has X, Y, but it's very, far, uh, very, very difficult to kind of see anything out of it because it, you can look at it from different perspectives. As a toy, it looks nice, but when you have to write, publish in a newspaper or a, a report as a data scientist, you cannot have this. 
And what about if you have more than three dimension, four dimension? How would you represent it? That's why most data science problems prefer two dimension because it's easy to see, it's static, and you don't have to be interactive. But three dimensions are very difficult to observe and even plot. So, <clears throat> so now that brings us to, uh, so that those are the questions I wanted to kind of uh, clarify. But I want to make a quick announcement here. We are going to have, for your better understanding, feedback lectures. That means you send me questions into this email. I will look at all the questions. Then I will record video or any like a material on PDF. I can handwrite, explain it, what it means, and mail it to you. Or it will send you a link, and you'd be able to view your answer. You don't have to wait till the end of the week. And I can do once or twice a week easily. So if you send me questions by say Tuesday or Wednesday, it after one day I can make them available. So this should help you. So don't wait for any uh, <clears throat> doubts if you have after the class, just send us an email. Next, I shared the notebooks. And if you have any question, let me know in installing or viewing the net notebooks so that you can play around with it. Then I talked about today, and I will mail out syllabus every day, or not every day, every week, before, uh, maybe by Monday or Sunday, I'll mail you the syllabus for the next class. And <clears throat> the idea of the syllabus is that we'll teach only on Saturday so that we don't have to arrange a lot of timing and all. And I will finish one to two topics, not more than that. You'll be more confused if I cover unnecessarily too many topics so that we have the same context, we discuss thoroughly, slowly, give ourselves time. Don't be in a rush, don't count time, and let's make sure we understand one topic. Today, what you are going to learn is essentially in a BSc levels, statistics majors, three to four classes. The reason they take that long because they teach in a very pedagogical way. Things that are very dry, not required, that is useful for exams, but as data scientists, you don't care about regurgitating uh, memorized like uh, definitions. That's not useful to you. You need to know the concepts, not to pass an exam. Uh, you need. So then, next week, we are going to talk about recommendation systems. So recommendation systems are a very hot topic. And Chiranjeev here and Somia here can even tell you that they use it in uh, practice who are among our audience today and uh, they use it in practice actually they, they build recommendation systems and this is a serious thing so idea is that you take data about who bought what and how do you recommend more stuff into those customers this is this is the way uh, recommendation systems are used for that so um, do you have any questions maybe we wait here for a 30 seconds see if somebody has any questions uh, if not, then we will proceed with our today's syllabus. Uh, uh, hi, Kishori. This is Kamal here. Any Kamal, PM? yes, go ahead. Kamal. Yeah, yeah, hi. Actually, uh, I had missed uh, last week's session due to some mm -hmm. uh, official uh, engagements. Yeah. So, uh, do you have anything like you'll be recapping or I'll have to go to the video and then uh, then right. I can go, go, go to the doubts? Actually, last week we uh, discussed a lot of topics. Maybe yeah, you yeah. Look, up, look up the video and ask me questions. I would be very happy to actually uh, make a okay. special video for you if you have any questions. Uh, okay. Also, what I'm trying to do is that each week's topic is independent. So to okay. this topic, you don't need to worry about like if I if you miss last week. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I was coming to because that I'll not be able to uh, reconnect or connect. Uh, last week's things. That's great. And one okay, more thing. No uh, one more thing, uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do we have this uh, session always this time, or do you have an option to have in the early morning India time? Do you have any such plan? Uh, so far, we have settled on this because it seems to work out for everyone. Uh, okay. You know, and of course we can move probably forward about an hour or so. 
So not no 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 not an hour because that will be difficult, uh, Kishori. If at all okay. it works out in the morning, that will be really good. Morning. Yeah, time, Kishori. Morning yeah, if, even even I would prefer that. Like from my end. maybe you can take a poll. Like who, how many of them prefer in the morning? Like uh, because that would be really helpful. Like. In the evening, you may have some other assignments and other things. So even yeah, if it is morning, kids around and everything. Uh, yeah, exactly. Weekend will be really busy. Yeah, right, right, right. So, so see, at the end of the day, it's all it's a uh, mutual uh, agreement. So you guys, you can have a decision. But from my end, I would support to have in the early morning. Where even yeah. if it is six or seven hour time, no problem. Should not be problem. I think, I think, I think all, all of you here, we will send an uh, we'll send an participation mail. Uh, Who would like to have what time? So we we'll take it offline probably. That will be uh, that will work, I guess. I will send an offline mail to everyone. Hope that right. that should. Work. All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, uh, Kishori, I have some questions for you. Sure. Yeah. No, no. I think not. Uh, maybe in online now. I want to discuss. Uh, this is uh, regarding some probability questions I have got, and some uh, regarding some hypothesis. Uh -huh. uh, so I'll I'll send out a mail to you, or can I call you? I pinged you actually yesterday. Uh, either way, I'm uh, sometimes um, you might be able to send me a question directly and I'll uh, think about it uh, in advance because uh, when somebody asks me a question, I try very hard to make sure that I actually think a lot so that I can make you understand the easiest possible way. So if you send me earlier, then I can think about it and then I'll send you or give you a call. Would that be okay? Yes, yes. That's so I would love to. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I say that today I'm able to condense so many classes like in a big bestsellers level and statistics major because I thought a lot about how to give you the demo. I built these programs, uh, created data sets, got data sets. So I will try my best in that way so that the learning is as easy as possible. And I want to go straight into the intuition and your understanding and um, also that will reduce you know, math as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Any other questions? Great. So let's start by wiping this whiteboard and talk about random variables and regression at the same time. And that's the beauty of how we are learning here. Learn and teach. Okay. <clears throat> Random variable is essentially, think of it like a variable that can take values. For example, if you throw a Ludo die, so it can have outcomes one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is the outcome. In numbers, they can be of two types, either discrete numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, or continuous any outcome. Say you wake up and throw some, I don't know, a ball up to the, you know, uh, in, in the air. And that height could be say 10, five meters, 5.1. So these are both random variables. If I think that your strength is more of a random, but think about it. If you throw a Ludo, you get these six outcomes. And most of the time we think you have one sixth of the time, you will get one. One sixth of the time, you will get two, and so on. So these are random experiments. What about throwing a ball up in the sky? Like this, up to the air. So you throw here. Each time you throw, sometimes, like this, you'll get different heights. Sometimes 5.7, sometimes 5.9, sometimes 4.3. What about this? These are random variables too. But this is not equal chance. What happens is that if you keep doing this experiment many, many, many times, if you plot for the Ludo, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and this is safe counting, you'll get more or less equal number. Not exactly, but more or less. As you do more, you'll see this equal. What about this? Here, this is the number you see in the X. I'll call it X, how many times? 
Here, it's height. How often you go? So this is zero because we know that it cannot be negative. It can be anything. So around five, you'll see most of you, the time you, if you count, most of the time you are somewhere here. Fewer and fewer and fewer. So there is some factor, what it shows that most of them peak around say 5.1 most of the time. And, but if you really are very precise, like no, no, what about 5.1.1? It is very unlikely I'll exactly meet 5.1. Very unlikely. So here is what you do to solve the problem. This is easy, right? You have one, two, three, four, five, six. There is no ambiguity. There is nothing called 2.3 here. But look at this guy, what he's doing. He's going on throwing. If you really plot it, it's any number, say from up to say, this is say, I don't know, eight. So 5.1. Next time it might be 5.1.2. So you got two dots, two dots, you know, uh, you got one time you got, another time you got, so you'll never get exact height if you really look at decimal. Everything is more and more dots, you see? Maybe move around here, but every number you'll get only one. But then what are we talking about, histogram? So what we do is that we make buckets out of here. Okay, I'm going to make small buckets here. Here, most of them, I got seven. So let's say this is five, six, seven. So this bucket, I draw according to seven here because I got more here. Here I got five, five maybe. And here I got six maybe, maybe more. So, and so on, as you keep drawing these buckets, it depends on the size of the bucket now. But the idea is that, as you make the bucket smaller, that gives you like par square feet or par unit, how much are you getting? Because then you can actually divide it. So think about it for a second, that in the real random variable, no two experiments will actually, the probability that you exactly get the same numbers up to many, many decimal places, maybe you can get 5.12, Maybe the next time you get 5.1000000, but you'll never be exactly equal. So the chances of being two dots, one on top of another is almost zero. But we still need a way to say that around here. So we gather that in buckets and then look at the count together. And as we have more and more points, we have more and more dots here, then the buckets, we can proportion it. And then we want to make sure that the buckets all add up to one so that we normalize it. This is called normalizing it. Say you have five classes you took. If you sum and they each classes you get grades between zero to 100. And if you add them up, it's 500. But what you do, whatever you grade, grades you get, you sum them up for all subjects and divide by 500. So that will be between zero and one. So this is called normalization. Most of the time people like to think in terms of overall percentage, either between zero and one or between zero and 100. So now as you keep doing this, this becomes smoother and smoother, these buckets, because you have in each bucket a lot of you know, dots landing here. You are going on doing this trial experiment, keep on throwing the balls many, many times independently. And then you'll see these strips become thinner and thinner so then progressively, and this will come bring us to a very interesting topic. You'd be surprised to see actually. Next one would be here. Next one would be here. Next one, next bin would be here. A bin is like has a width, okay? So, so I'm not going to draw all of it, but it will look like something like that. Something, some shape. We don't know what this shape is. It depends from the type of experiment you do. The shape that you get by make, doing more and more experiments, this is called, and, and it's normalized to one, that means the area under that, so you divide in enough that it shrinks. 
the area is one, but do not distort the shape. It's called, this function is called distribution. Distribution. In the discrete case, you call it distribution. But here it looks like density. How many are here in this small region? Because we know that we cannot talk about how many times I got the same thing. So you make, that's why it look, it's called density distribution. Density distribution. Uh, do you have any question in this? Maybe I should. Okay. So what is this distribution? Now think about it. Uh, sorry. Oh, what do you mean by this density and distribution? Uh, say that again. Oh, what is the difference between density and distribution? Oh, okay, yes. That is a very good question. And that is at the heart of you have to, uh, we have to know about it very carefully. Okay. <clears throat> and I will stick with these two examples so that we thoroughly understand it. So distribution essentially tells you what is the, let's say the Ludo example, you can get one, two, three, four, and six. And let's say its plot is here. Okay. And if then we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So essentially the distribution tells you proportion of outcomes. Here in the case of Ludo, we have a die, six outcomes. And and I want to do a counting here. Am I, point 0.5, one, 1.5, so on. I know that everyone would be one six possibility. So one six possibility is like, how much is one six? So 17, yeah, something close to 0.7. So maybe, uh, no. So how much should we do? So one sixth would be, so one third of half. So Neil, do you know how, what is the exact decimal point one sixth? It's 0.33, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, point, no, point three three would be one third. Then you divide it by two, it would be point one six. Six, maybe point one six six six. It goes on, I think. Are you saying one by six or one by three? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So, no, I'm trying to plot it here, right here. So, now you have that point one six six would be I divided by five, closer to so everything has this much chance. And if you add them up, all the one sixth, these are one sixth one six, six of them, all of them, you get one. So you will get all equal in theory, or if you do keep doing more experiments. So this is the proportion with respect to one. So one is our hundred. Is this part clear, Somia? Sorry, yes. Okay, great. Let us call this distribution. So what do we get in a distribution? Then how do you write it? Well, distribution you write like this. Uh, there are many symbols. I will write probability here because it's discrete. There are only six or number of choices. X equal to probability or chances that X is equal to one. We know it can be one through six is one six. Similarly, X is equal to two. Chances are also one six. Well, let's continue. X equal to three, the same thing. Instead of writing equal, equal every time, these are all equal. X equal to four, X equal to five. These are all one six. So the way you read this is this, probability, that x 
is equal to three is one six. That's the result. So that means the chances, if you keep doing this experiment many, many, many times, that you will get x equal to three, or you get three as the outcome, because that's a random variable, this outcome is three is one sixth of the total number of trials you do. If you do one billion, then the number of things you will get is 10 to the power nine by six. This many, you can get, expect to get three if you keep doing the Ludo trial, uh, the, keep tossing the die. So that's how you can say that, you know, this is a distribution. So essentially, what did I tell you now? Probability that X is any I, I can be anything. Why should I keep writing three, four, five, six like that? It is going to drive me crazy. I'm going to get tired of it. I'm going to give you a symbol rather. This one sixth for I, any of them, for I, as you know, I is equal to one, two, three. This is a condensed way of writing, right? So now, what are the proportion fraction of time I'm going to get one or two or three or four, five, six, always, because every trial, I'm going to get one of them. So that's why you can say, I can sum them. If I sum all of these, x equal to one, x equal to two, and so on, adding all the way up to x equal to six. This better be all these six one sixth. Better be one. So because that's all I see. So you have to clarify what is the outcome of the random variable exhaustively. A die cannot have more than six. It has to be one of them. Or in short, you can write this as probability x equal to i one through six. So if you sum up all the probability, you know, this is, then it's one. There's no escape from it. Or some people will write, instead of i, you can write x, little x. This is big x means random variable. Little x means a value. This is called a dummy value. You see, it doesn't matter what you put. This means keep expanding. <clears throat> I can call it i, j, whatever I want. So that means when j equal to one, you keep on doing the sum for different values. First, j equal to one, then, j equal to two, so on, j equal, x, j equal to six. So these variables that you use to signify this compact notation, these are called dummy variable, D-U-M-M-Y variable. This doesn't mean you can use any symbol you want because essentially you are using a complex situation that's well, when j equal to one, what is it? j equal to two, three, four. It could as well, you might write, x any symbol so now this 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 is a probability distribution this call so now let's go back to what is probability distribution once more now that i have started writing in symbols what is changing here when i give a number i i say hey hey when i is one what is the value okay this is it great when i is four, what is the value? You'll say, oh, this is it. Great, one sixth, fine. Look at it, this looks like, like a function of i x, some function of i. This is the symbol I can use, function. Except this x tells you I'm related to that Ludo dive random variable. I'm talking about Ludo trial, not something else, not a ball, not some you know, basketball game or soccer or cricket score. See, for every value of i from one to six, you have a value. Look at it. Six, one, six, that's it, basically. So then you might say, this looks like a function. Well, the probability distribution is a function of the value you get from the experiment. So ex think of experiment as like a physical thing. You do a Ludo trial and you come up with a number. 
And these functions where you can put one, two, three, four, this kind of discrete, not real numbers, not like 5.3, not like square root of pi. These are called discrete random variables. D-I-S-C-R-E, discrete random variables. Any question? Now we will see how to generalize it to continue us. Any question here? Feel free to ask any question. Uh, hi, Kishori. Yeah, hey, Mithun. Uh, hi, Kishori. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you please come again the last part, the discrete random variables? Yes. <laughs> so discrete random variables, it's called discrete. It's like chunks. So the random variables that take discrete values, that means one, two, three, four, five, six, or maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like not these kind of numbers numbers without decimals. Anything that do not take this kind of value, those random variables are called discrete random variables. For example, um, yeah, so did it clarify? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. thank you. So now we'll think about continuous, which we just have seen the example that when you toss a ball up to the air, in the air, what is the height that it goes up to? Because height can be any number, one meter, 1.2 meters, 0 0.30 meters, 0.78, something, any number you pick real number that is positive, these are called continuous. Because if you look at these numbers, any, any dot has a number. This could be 4.3 maybe. This could be maybe 4.876. So it's continuously you can have number. These are called continuous random, those will be called continuous random variable. But let's go and see what's about continuous random variable. But for discrete, I know because these i's can be taking discrete numbers, one, two, three, four, I can have a function from this. So if you recall your 12th grade math, when you learned about function, it will say that, well, you have a mapping from some domain X, this X will map to some range Y, right? This is, so that's what a distribution is. Now, what is this function? Let's look at it. What do we get here? If we think of it like a function, it's just useful to think of this like a function because we need to sum them up to do our calculation. <clears throat> so, here is the Ludo example die. X can be any experiment, right? The faces. So you do a trial, you get one of these experiment. But look at it, your trial is a physical phenomena. You are doing something and then you associate a number with it, okay? Uh, oh, thank you, I forgot that Mithun sent that answer, yeah, 1.166. Um, so this function tells you that take any value, it goes into, maybe there are many values, but it somehow only goes to one over six, that's all. It's a very simplified way of looking at, but this, tells you that one sixth of the time you get this experiment. So this is a function. All it takes is any X here, little value F I I can use because capital X I have already used Y. It only takes you to one sixth, pretty boring function. It's nothing much going on. So let's go to continuous and then I want to talk about regression soon after that. Now let's live in the same world so that we can superimpose Let's talk about throwing the ball into the air. Now, instead of one, two, three, four, five, six as being die numbers, I want to say it is meters that you can throw the ball up to. These are in meters. But look at it, the numbers remain the same, except now you will have balls going up to 2.4, 3.8, all possible numbers. So now, let's look at a small region. Because we know that every time you throw a ball, 
no way on earth you will ever in life, even if you throw a billion times, you'll never get exact number if you keep counting every possible decimal places. Say I say I have an instrument I claim that I can measure up to like 48 decimal places and you keep throwing, I bet you'll never exactly match another trial that goes exactly to the 40 decimal places and it comes because it's random. The chances of it is happening is extremely low. But however, if you keep doing that experiment, 10 to the power of 10,000 maybe, maybe you might up to 40 decimal places go there. But then I can say, no, what about 60 decimal places? Then I say, I'll do this many. Well, there are so many possibilities that this number is much, much, much bigger than the number of particles in the entire universe. So you are going actually into the very crazy, unthinkable domain. But anyhow, let's talk about distribution here. So let's look at a small region. Sure, I can never see two things exactly the same, but what about an interval delta? Maybe if I keep doing a lot of experiments in this bucket delta, which may be 0.5 here, I get some counts. So what I do now in this continuous, I divide the whole interval into little deltas. I'll tell you what delta should be. Delta is small, maybe. Maybe take it 0.1 meter. Then you count how many landed here between say, I don't know, three, between three, this delta first one is next to three is, is it goes from three to 3.1 meters. Maybe this one is, that this is delta one, that delta two, two is say maybe some one I'm considering 5.1 to 5.2. So essentially the whole line has many, every point one there is a delta, 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 delta. So if you were to write it, it will be one delta one, delta two, delta three, four, and so on and on, going on. So I have made buckets, but there is no gap. It's filled with delta. So now you do your experiments again and again and again, and start counting how many landed here in this bucket region. And now I want to look at percentage wise. I don't care about exact numbers. I like to think about percentage because the more the number of times I try, of course I'm going to get more numbers, but I want a trend. If I do 10,000, say I get five here, and if I do 20,000, I might get 10 most likely. Accordingly, everything will be double. So why worry yeah. about it? Why not? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's a, a little bit of, uh, there's a question actually. There's an information. Oh, I saw, I'm sorry, yeah. From Zitendor. Uh, Kishore, growing on board can be a little bit bigger. It is not very clear due to the distance between the, okay, sure. Okay. <clears throat> so let me lar draw a little larger. Yeah. So come back to the experiment again. Of throwing the ball. One meter, two meter, three meter, four, five, six, okay. So now I'm interested only in percentage. By percentage, I mean actually zero to one. You can put the multiply it by 100 and make it a percentage, but let's look at it. <clears throat> I'm interested here in this bucket, say 0.1. So zero to, this is zero to 0.1. The next one would be 0.1 to 0.2. The next one would be, I don't know, 0.2 to 0.3, so on. So you have lots of little deltas. Let's look at one of them here. Here, delta. This is from uh, 3.0 to 3.1, let's look at it. So as you keep throwing the balls many, many times, you keep counting. What we want to see is that, let's look at, compare with it. 
So suppose you are making a claim that most of the time, man, if he throws a ball, it lands up around 0.5 or five, five meter is the standard height. So what you would notice here is that if you have a delta that counts in that bin, if you count how many times, is much bigger. The one right next to this, maybe 5.1, 5.2, 5.1 is slightly less. 5.1 to 5.2, maybe slightly less. Maybe like this. So similarly, slightly less than five. Yeah, maybe around here. Maybe around here. But look at this. Each one of them, the width is, range is, 0.1 range, it's all point, the width is range, I call it delta, that's of 0.1. So you keep counting. But they're all normalized as percentages. So that when you add all this, all the way up to here, I don't know, maybe these ones have hardly anything, almost few, almost zero. So I'm not going to draw the, all the, these lines, but if you plot, make delta smaller and smaller and you increase the experiments, you will get a shape. So now look at delta. The way I say it is that if I make a bucket delta, what percentage do I get? Well, now you are going to say, what is delta? How big should delta be? Should it be small? I say, yeah, make it smaller, no problem. Even if you want to make it smaller, that's fine. It will be just maybe slight adjustment in the shape, maybe now you'll have thin little delta, but it will fit much, much nicer in this curve, much nicer. So instead of talking delta as say 0.1 or 0.01 or 0.001, let's talk about density. How much do I get? What is the percentage do I get per unit? It's just a, like a, it's a behavior right in this small region if your delta is small. So you like to call about, talk about as a density. So that means percentage par when delta is one. It is not the entire delta as one here, but as if, if it was here, what is the density? So essentially you do is that you will count how many number you get coin and make delta small. So it's like per unit, per unit measurement. We measure our cloth in say, oh, per meter, what is the cloth? Or oh, 300 rupees. We always do per meter. Doesn't mean that I will buy always a meter. It's per unit. So that is the easiest way to talk about a continuous random variable because no two experiments land at the exact same place. So all you can talk about is a range per some unit. And these are distributions that have values all around. In this case, our random variable about tossing a ball in the air, usually random variables are written as X or Y. These symbols are used. Z, some people use that capital, X, Y, Z. Okay, let's stick with X for our experiment. This X can be any number between zero to one. So you use the square bracket, zero to infinity. That means any number between zero to infinity. So, so the Ludo case, you'll have to write like this. Because they are not every number is possible, you write this funny bracket, curly bracket, okay? Curly bracket, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is just a symbol. This is to mean discrete, this curly bracket. When you do square, that means anything is possible between zero to infinity. These are called continuous random variable. Random variable. So that means they take real numbers or float what you write in your code, right? Integer should be discrete. You are all you all know programming, so you know this is one. So let me give me a second. This computer sometimes logs me out. Yeah, okay. So this kind of um, continuous random variable. The Ludo one is a discrete random variable. OK, 
Okay. So now this function that represents density per unit, you can use, it's called probability density function. Usually people use the fx. Previous one also you can use fx. People tend to write this as p of x, whatever. This is the style for discrete. For continuous, fx. f actually little x because we represent per unit. Now, with this, I'm going to show you one quick thing, uh, two things, and then we'll go to regression. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that suppose you were tossing this ball again and again, and this is the shape of the trend you get. Most of the time you are very high around five meter, maybe then it increases once in a while you get more than six, you never get much. So this gives you a proportion, right? And you are strong enough that you never, and say you try your best always every time. And this time maybe you missed your step and then you threw up only half a meter. So what is giving all this randomness? Many, many factors. We do not even know your body, your mind, the wind, the air, too many factors are there. And that's how the data scientists are in, going to look at it. Like what are these factors that really decide the variability? What really is, the, where is this variability is coming from? And for discrete, we have a discrete probability then a function, distribution function. There we have a density because it's continuous. I cannot represent it as every single value. So I do a chunks and this is the shape I get. So that means these functions most of the time are very nice actually. For example, in Gaussian, normal random, this function you get two pi e raised to the power minus x squared. You're like, where does this come out of? Magic? Somehow in nature people do experiment and they see that this actually shows up. This is what the function looks like more and more when you do experiments. And then we'll discuss why this is so important. And this distribution, the formula, it looks like this. Let me tell you about it. That is called Gaussian distribution because there can be many shapes. There is one shape that is so important. I'm going to tell you about it. <clears throat> Our trend is that, so this is going to be called Gaussian normal. G-U-S-S-I-A-N, Gaussian or normal distribution. This is a mother of all distribution, you can say. And you all have done it in some way, and I'll remind you. You are all mostly from electrical engineering or computer science or that kind of background or engineering physics or physics background. You'll see this will show up. This Gaussian distribution, the shape looks like this. And I'm going to actually, so usually, it has a mean. Somewhere this peak matches with this mean. They use the symbol mu. And it's, so that means the proportion of tosses from this distribution, whatever experiment it generates, I do not know. Maybe it's a noise of an amplifier. Maybe it's the noise in data that we don't know. Maybe it's the noise in an electrical interference when you start your microwave oven. There is usually a peak. This is where the most of the noises or randomness is. Then extremes are fewer and it goes, takes any value up to positive infinity, uh, that is positive infinity to negative infinity. It can be any value, but chances are that it is very high is low. It quickly drops. You know, there are always some possibility. If you keep doing the same experiment once in a while, maybe this is 0 0.00001, maybe what happens one billion, once in a billion. <clears throat> so now the question is, why is this distribution so special? And how, what is it? Well, it has two parameters. Usually. Where it is peaked, that's called the mean. And how wide this is, because there could be another, also Gaussian, maybe, 
of course there is one trick i'm going to draw that there is another example you know here you should actually say no this is doesn't make sense how can it maybe more in every aspect it's like saying somebody says that hey i got more uh, we you were both doing two experiments you and i and it's about the ludo and you are saying that hey i tell you that hey i got um, Five percent. Let me give you an example. Say Ludo example. One, two, three, four, five. And I say that you know what? I get ten percent one, twenty percent one, and then ten percent three, six. I get another ten percent. So how much is it? Ten plus two is fifty, and the rest I get twenty-five percent and twenty-five percent. I come like, oh, you get this, I get even more. I get 20% here, 40% here, and 10% 10, 10 here, 10% here, 50% here, 50% here. You are like, what nonsense? How can you get something that adds up everything to more than 100? Here I make sense, right? 10%, 20, this is 50, 75%, 100%. This I'm exaggerating. Exaggerating my claims. How can if I sum up everything, you can have more than what there is? Exactly the same point here. You cannot have a distribution that is more in every sense than another distribution. If it is taller, my this is also Gaussian, but you will see that there is a cross. It will cross over. Oh, it has to give somewhere so that. Or maybe it is shorter than it better be here, goes less. So that means the area under each of these curves, this or this or this individually should all be adding up to one. Doesn't matter what it is. Because total number of trials you have done doesn't change. It is only where you different outcomes you get. Percentage outcome, if you sum up of different kinds, it should add sure, up. One second. The area under the curve is always one. Is it right? Yes. That is okay. because of that. Because we okay. want to see everything adds up to 100%. Okay. And one more thing. Is normal distribution is always a, a probability density function? Yes. Because normal distribution has to be the density because it is continuous. It can take any value from... The normal distribution can take any value. This means belongs to, okay? This symbol means, you know? Okay. It, it means it can take any value from positive to negative. So it must be continuous. Go ahead. Normal distribution we can do only for the continuous variables. I mean, we can check normal distribution. Yes, absolutely. For the continuous variables. Absolutely. Normal okay. distribution is always continuous. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So now you are asking, Hey, what is, what's, what's going on here? Like this is one, how do, what do you mean by one? And I'm going to show you one, I'm going to come back to it. But before that, let's go to regress on a little bit. And we'll soon come back to this. What do I mean by normal distribution is one? That's because quickly, if you divide it into buckets, like in de density, anything you add up to a distribution is a type of kind of experiment you are doing, right? Whatever proportion distribution, like dividing things up, the same thing, but proportion wise, it has to be 100%. That's all you have got. But the shape might be different. Normal distribution, the formula is this. To control where the mean is located, you need one value parameter. How wide or thin it is, is controlled by something called standard deviation. This is sigma. So that's why the formula is fx equal to and I'm going to plot it now, okay? So you exponentiate, this is, this is just a, oh, I think there is also a sigma, okay, sigma, and there is exponentiation, and this number, x minus mu square, and divided by two sigma square. So we should plot it, we will plot it now. But the interesting thing is that, remember, this is the function if you plot, this is as x and y, 
you'll always get this shape and we'll plot them now soon. Uh, but before that, remember that normal distribution is a general noise you get from somewhere. If you are designing an amplifier, any noise you want to assume that you have cannot explain, normal distribution. Most of the noise is in the middle and there is some plus minus here and there. But they always have this pattern. The proportion of higher values falls very quickly. So that means I can do the following thing. You are, most of you are from electrical engineering and I'm going to throw a formula and I'm going to do an experiment and see if we can derive. Suppose you were the scientist who are going to invent. All of us know this formula, voltage equal to IR. This is current, this is resistance, this is voltage. And this is somehow given to us in the textbook. That's why we are so happy about it. But say somebody is asking you to prove it. You know, somebody says, Rajan, can you prove it? Eh, Rajan will go and, you know, he will, you know, take a one voltage measuring instrument, well, and then current ampere uh, measuring, and then he will hook up some resistance of some ohm, and he will do this experiment. He will measure current and see the voltage. Measure current and see the voltage. This is what he's going to do. He's going to plot the current and hold this. Voltage is in volts, I is in ampere shape. Resistance ohm, resistance is in ohm. So you plot one. Okay, great, this is like, looks nice. Then you plot, this is, whatever voltage you get, you go along y axis and you plot the i corresponding i. You keep plotting, it's up to you. How many you want to plot? You are never going to get a straight line, like beautiful straight line in life. Always there is error. And you still want to claim this is what the relationship is. This is the formula. Like this is it. You're so confident, but what you got is a bunch of dots along a straight line. It looks like approximately, you can say all these things are because of noise, because you know what? My, um, Current measuring instrument, nowadays they are digital, probably. This voltmeter, these are all digital. They are not very accurate, up to two decimal places or three decimal places. Or the wire itself is not clean. It has more voltage added. It's not without zero. So there is always some error. I cannot help it. That's what you would say. And that's what you would say to the marketing team for sales and, I don't know, news, uh, advertisement, you know, revenue, relationship, all these things. So the question is, this is the simplest relation. I mean, and you know that this is one of the simplest formula you have seen in physics. In your, uh, you know, <clears throat> and you want to draw a straight line. But when you do the experiment, you can never get a straight line. What is wrong with it? So this will bring us to the topic of linear regression. The goal is that I want to claim that, look, there is this nice line. It goes right through the middle. So then some one of you might come and say, no, 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 no. You know what? I have a better line for you. Maybe, maybe this is better. I like this. Then another guy comes, he says, oh, well, you know what? I can do better than that. You guys are really not good at drawing. Look at my team. This is where it should be. Which one is right? Of course, we know that this is crazy. This doesn't make anything sense. This is, seems to be the right line. This also seems to be a right line. Maybe this. Oh, maybe not this one that much because it's not going through zero as much. There is this intercept here also. This seems to be going through zero, maybe right, but maybe that is also going through zero, but slightly tilted. Which one is good? So maybe I should wait here for, uh, you know, like a few minutes break. And also uh, before the break, I want to discuss, uh, you know, take questions if you have, because this needs, so I'm thinking. Any questions? Neil, are you there? Yes. Okay. Rupesh, any question? Uh, hi, Kishori. 
is Vignesh. Yeah. Yeah. So as usual, so discrete values will not contain decimal, right? Say it again. Uh, discrete values will not contain decimal, right? Uh, it will not. Uh, yes, it will not contain decimal. Yes. Uh, there what? is a slight problem though. Discrete and decimal. You can if you want to force, but they are always in chunks. Say Ludo, although you get one, two, and three, four, and five, and six, I can call 1.1, 2.2 for, I can just invent 3.3, .3, but you really cannot do calculation on it. These are meaningless discretization. These are artificial. Uh, but really, yes, you should not have decimal. Uh, or, Decimals, but not every possible decimal, only a few number that you can count. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. So, Mia, any question? No, Kishori, not good. Okay. Uh, Komal? Uh, Kishori, uh, can you give one more example of a discrete function? other than uh, uh, right. Ludo die. Great, uh, discrete random variable. It is yeah. a function, but mm -hmm. uh, discrete random variable. Yes, I'll give you. Coin toss, simplest of all. See, I got away easily without working too hard. Coin toss, either you get head or tail. That is also a discrete random variable and I can call it one or two if i want to uh, but this is one random variable the outcomes are head or tail another one what about two coins at a time i do not interpret separately i have i call the first coin and the second coin so the random variable should be first one head second one head first one head second one tail 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 head you see, uh, these are discrete, and I can associate numbers with them, right? Uh, one, oh, so not this one. This is just the coins to say. This is, I can call it one, two, three, four. So there is one. This is one coin toss. Uh, what other thing? Will it rain today or not? X is rain. If it is zero, no rain. If it is one, it's going to rain. More relevant example, credit card. You are a data scientist. You need to figure out from data who is a good creditor, who is going to default, or good or bad. That might be, of course, that might be based on data. One, two, good, not so good or bad. So that one. Or if any event that can happen, but only fewer number of choices. Uh, did it clarify, Kashobi? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so okay, so that's um, so Sorry, now. Kishori, yeah. Kishori, I have a question. Yeah. So coming back to that, um, you know, the credit card. Uh huh. That example that you have quoted. Uh huh. In this kind of very objective kind of, sorry, in subjective kind of yes. idea, yes. the things are not very head and tail kind of stuff. Absolutely. So, how come to a conclusion in that case? Okay. That brings us to a topic, and I will explain that subjective and objectivity. And uh, after that, we'll take a break quickly. So, now let's go back to V equal to IR, the formula that we thought we really know. We think we know. Let's see what happens. V is a voltage that you would plot here, and that's the current you pass. I, R. But voltage is never exactly matching with this. Look at the points. None of them go through the exact V equal to I, R plot, even if we made one. So what is that extra coming from? These dots are always off. This is the error. So when we talk about credit card, maybe I have a way to tell 
people that whether he's a good credit card person or bad credit card person by looking at some of the parameters. But there is no guarantee. There is always this little confusion. And that is where random comes from. For example, suppose somebody never had a bad credit history. This is a great candidate. He is a good creditor. But is he always? Not exactly. There are always chances that things may go wrong. We may not be able to explain. And that's where your objectivity comes. The subjectivity comes from, I know this formula, more or less. I have an idea, but this is where I do not know. Things are out of control. This is the error. And that is coming, why? And I'll show you uh, why. So did it explain, Neil? There is, although you can predict from the behavior or characteristic, the answer, there is this unknown randomness that comes from somewhere we don't know always. Right, that clarifies, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Auditi, any questions? Just trying to see if I uh, have any questions. That's okay. Uh, so, uh, shall we then take like a, about, I don't know, maybe 10 minute break. Then I'm going to fit this and we are going into linear regression. That is going to be very interesting. And I'm going to show you some plots and we are going to make some plots and explain with some data analysis. How does it sound, Neil? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we'll come back in exact 10 minutes. All right. Yeah, okay.
Okay. Neil? Yes. Uh, can you please increase the volume? Yes, I will increase the volume. How is it now? A uh, little more. Is it better? Is it? Yeah, it's better now. Okay. So, uh, let me know when we should begin. Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we will wait for another one or two minutes and okay. we'll start. Uh, yes, Kisuri, I think we can start. Okay. Is my voice clear enough? Good. Uh, yes. Okay. So, now we are going to go to regression. And we know that in a perfect world, we should have a linear, like this is called linear. This is one variable that uh, is called explanatory variable. And this is the result, V, dependent variable. Or some people call it independent variable independent variable and this is called dependent variable because you change this and you get the result of that but yet even though this is supposed to be the relationship but you get some noise plus minus and that's where we were not able to get this nice formula but what we need is a formula clean enough so that it explains the points why do we need it in physics you know this is a given relationship what if somebody gave you marketing and revenue relationship and you need to create a formula this way you can predict if somebody tells you ask you that hey i want to spend this much money what's the amount of revenue i can expect then you look up your formula and plug it in of course you have to know what these values are and you are all done you'll be able to project it you are predicting it so now let's i want to take you to one interesting thing here what is this randomness where is it coming from? Well, most people think that this is normally distributed. For every point, there is a normal distribution. So that means, let me remove this distracting line here. This, some of the lines. So they think, suppose there is a line that is the true relationship. Maybe the blue line, not this one. I'll remove it. Actually, the, I'll keep the purple line. I'll put the dots back here. Actually, really, probably this is the case that was going on this purple line. And all these are deviations from the truth. Somehow this noise messed it up. It was supposed to be here. It was supposed to be there. It was supposed to be here. But you got misplaced, displaced actually, because of this noise. So how much is the noise? What is the noise being added to? 
voltage. That's why I add it here. It's supposed to be here, but it got here. This is the point error for this guy. For this point, that is the amount of error. That is the amount of error. For this, there are two points here, okay? This is the error. Here is the error. Everywhere there is error. And what is an error? So error, we say, think that it comes from somewhere, a random trial. There is a gnome, it's like a little demon, uh, imaginary character that displaces it. It tosses a Gaussian random number it gets, adds it and displaces it. And because, and, and you see that this is considered, it follows this formula. Well then, if you really plot it, so this is increased in the positive direction, negative direction, positive, negative, negative direction, positive. Essentially, you can think of it like around this point with this mean peak, there is a nice distribution. This is the mean, there is a nice distribution. Too bad in this case, because of a random trial error, it was here. So you'll see that there are distributions around every point in the line, every line. You can assume that there could be an error nicely, you know, plus minus a little bit off here and there. Most of the time, the mean, the peak is going to be the actual value, V equal to IR, but some error is displacing it. So we should think of it like our formula is almost right and the peak is exactly here, some error. In this case, what is the peak of this error? Because it can go positive, negative, and we want it to peak at when there is no error, zero is the error, no error. So I'm just imagining this is a zero, this is negative for this. This is the zero of this scale. So you can think of at every little point there is a random thing. Zero is the peak because this is where you are not supposed to have any error. That's where it's peak, but around there, so you'll find your noise actual value around there. Do you have any questions, Somia? Any question? No, 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 Mr. So you are seeing, right? So every time you like this formula, but nothing. every, go ahead. No, nothing. Okay, great. Uh, so think about it in, in this way. At every point, the world is perfect, but somehow there is an error and that error follows normal. Then you might ask, why normal? Why not some other distribution? Why does it go only in positive direction? Why does it shape like this? Why is it that there is a peak and quickly it drops? Now I'm going to tell you a very interesting theory. It's called central limit theorem. Central limit theorem. So think about a noise, right? Then there is, maybe there are many sources of noise. Think about when you are in your room and you hear all this noise from the city all around. One of them is loud, one of them is humming, some constant background humming. And one again, there is a blacksmith hitting the hammer on the anvil. You keep hearing all these random noises at any point of time, say, think about in Mumbai. You, even in the quietest place, there is always some background noise. So those are essentially, you know, sound waves propagating and coming to you. Some are, you know, they're interfering, but there are many, many sources of it. Think of them as random variables, some random thing. And they all come, but usually you'd see that in amplifiers or systems, they always assume normal. What about modeling the noise of the world, you know, can you do that? But it turns out that if many random variables that are independently created and you add them up, which is what you hear in the sound, all adding up, and you take the average of them, as you take more and more noise, the resulting guy is also a random variable, except it has many, many random things together, put together, it's also random, right? That surprisingly behaves more and more like normal distribution. It is a famous theorem proven by mathematicians with a lot of hard work. It's called central limit theorem. It comes, if you add so many independent of similar type 
random variables, the result, data average, in some way it becomes normally looking distribution. This is very surprising and amazing. And you have to go deep into probability theory to be able to prove it, but we don't need to worry about it. But I'm just explaining the concepts. And that's why I was saying that this is almost like the mother of all distribution. You use normal distribution everywhere. If somebody as a data scientist tells you, hey, can you model this? And you are like, yeah, I'm going to model this. As long as it is positive and negative, both values can happen. Or maybe it is mostly positive, but not negative, but it is positive deep enough to hide away person. Anything you model, say your model is saying that for the military, what is the height I should take for this age and that age, whatever, you know, it gives like 170, I don't know, five inches or whatever. And you can say usually people are around here, they are distributed like this. One or two guys are very tall. But approximately normal, of course, normal, actual normal distribution takes value up to any positive. Here you are never going to get 1,000 inches tall person. But this is in data science, you assume that for all practical purpose, it's not going to matter. The error of making that assumption is extremely uh, less, less harm, insignificantly harmful. I mean, because of having this distribution, it's mathematically or computationally much easier to deal with than exact matching with real life. It should be close, but not exact. And that is one of the things to realize. So I want to actually now, if you have any question, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'm going to show this in experiment, actually, this formula. OK, so let me share my screen and show you some code how we create this normal distribution from different various distributions. Neil, is my voice clear enough? Yes, it is clear. Okay. So here I want to show you something. Okay. So probability distribution, I'm going to share my screen in a second. Uh, share screen, share entire screen. Share, great, great. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. All right. So let's talk about distribution. Last time, I told you about Jupyter Notebook. This is a way to quickly do experiments for data scientists without writing full code. Here, I'm importing some libraries called pandas and numpy, which you will learn. And we call it in short PD. And we have to execute this Jupyter Notebook, all of them. The way you execute is that you put your cursor there and do shift enter. So libraries are loaded, otherwise it will complain. So now, I'm going to create a Ludo random zero to one, and I'm going to plot it, the frequencies. Great, I found it. So next, this is the data we don't need. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to create different data sets, and I want to show you normal here. So this is the central limit theorem here. Central limit for mean equal to one I'm going to create. So what I'm doing is that I'm doing a random Poisson. This is a Poisson distribution and I'll explain what's a Poisson distribution and I'll plot it for you, okay? So this is a discrete random variable. That means it can take one, two, three, four, or five, that's solid values only. And then whatever value it comes and let me then show you Poisson, how it looks. It has a mean and it has this formula. So if k is the outcome, the possibility of k is this. So as k increases, the fraction, this is the density function or distribution function, the weight decreases. But again, some of all of them should be one. But nevertheless, let me show you some of these. So here, for this formula, I'm called, this is mu symbol, e to the power mu mu is one, I'm going to take. And I'm going to generate Poisson random variable, many of them here, out how many of them? 20,000 of them. And put it in an array. 
and I call the array results nums. Then I'm putting in a data frame and I'm just plotting it. Let's see how it looks. Okay, see, it is discrete. You see, you always get zero or one or two or three or four, or you might get even five. Why did you not get five? Yeah, well, you may get if you do many, many experiments. Or you can get it by changing this parameter. So this changes the shape of the distribution slightly. This Let me make it two. And I will come back to this, but I'm just showing you that, look, this distribution is far from being normal. Ah, so this is mu. It, it looks like it's a discrete distribution. This is. It only takes zero, one, two, three, four, five, that kind of values. All right. So what is the big deal here? The big deal is that look at this. I am going to take many of these samples random and sum them and take the average and subtract the average and I'm going to plot it here. See, all of them are Poisson distribution and I'm summing them, all of them, whatever I got. And I'm creating a new random variable, the one I showed on the board. And look, I plot them. And if I plot them, oh, okay, something happened here. Mu equal to one, two results. Okay, let's see here what happened here. So maybe I should increase the number. It takes longer. It's computing. Okay, so it showed me a funny result. I don't know what happened here, but we are going to see now. Uh, let's see. So what are we doing here? So I'm taking a range of 10,000 random variables. I am computing the range. Let me see here. Uh, data nums, right? So I want to sum them up for you and divide it by Sn. Okay, so let me go there again. So now, uh, okay, here, here is the Poisson random variable, here it is. So I'm summing them, all our Poisson I'm summing, and I'm dividing it, and you see that the shape is looking like the normal distribution. It has negative as well, negative, but really, these were all discrete distributions. And I'm transforming it into a distribution which has, which looks like more and more normal. So that means as you add more and more random variables, you look more and more like a normal. Here is another example. I ran a thousand, increased it, and again it's see it's mean at zero, and this looks like a normal distribution. Uh, again, this is a random variable between one and four only. Nothing more than that, only one and four. When I run this code, again, I am supposed to get something like this, right? If I do one and four, this is for one and six, one to six. I should get something like that. But when I add them up, they somehow look like normal distribution, even though I did it from one to four. So this is the interesting thing about central limit theorem. That means addition of all these random noises that are independent, they naturally, it's going to look more and more as I keep increasing the number of experimentation. Keep, keep doing the same thing, eventually it becomes normal. So then I'm doing the same thing, random one to four and fitting. This is the normal that e to the power function I'm plotting. So you'll see more and more like becoming like normal. And these are the same, this is one to six. I took the Ludo die, I did the same treatment, sum them up, again, same shape. Here, I did not subtract with a mean, but you have to subtract with a mean, but it's mean around 700. So this shows that essentially, normal distribution comes out very easily from other distributions, from a lot of additions of independent distributions. Any questions here so far? Okay, uh, so far so good. So that means we are going to deal with normal distribution a lot. So now <clears throat> let me take you to regression. 
So regression is the plot we were trying to do. And I'm going to walk you through an example. The data comes from, I'm going to teach you both how to use Jupyter Notebook as well as how to look at the data. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of the class. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to ask any question or interrupt me. Okay, so here we go. In this notebook, I'm again going to use Panda and matplotlib to do the plotting. So I'll load it here. Then I am loading this data set that is found on the internet, advertising data. And I'm loading it. I can read off the internet with this function, Panda. It can pull data across the internet. So you don't have to have it sitting on your computer as long as we have this data on the internet in this website. So then I'm printing the first few lines. So this is a data set of about you know few hundred points, 200 points. So the first row is TV, how much money you spent on TV advertisement. How much money you, this is about marketing data. And how much money you spent on radio. And how much you spent on newspaper. And this is the sales. So for different situations, you are collecting for different companies, 200 companies, the amount of money they spent on TV, radio, and newspaper, and the corresponding sales. We are not worried about the unit. So now, your job is to do sales projection. Somebody gives you some amount of, somebody comes and say, hey, I spent this much money on TV, that much money on radio, this much money on newspaper. If I do that, what should be my sales? And you need to project it. Now let's look at how many points I got. This is, you type data sheet. That means 200 rows, four columns. So da, 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 it, it goes on. I, here, when you do head, it only shows you the five columns. But actually, there are 200 columns I can print out. Maybe I can try here. Let's see if I do data, what happens? See, it will show you all this data. You have all these data points. But we don't want to see all. So in order to do is that call size, maybe. Oh size is already a, not a function, it's a very attribute. So this is size, and the size is 200 times 4, 800 total. Shape is the structure, 200 rows by 4 columns. So now, before you make a comment, let's look at, is there any difference in the sales data, sales amount, based on how much money you spend? Uh, do you have any question? Feel free to me. Uh, feel free to stop me anytime. This is a real life data we are going through. Hi, Kishori. Hey, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, but, but you are using data dot head right? by default. How it's taking only five rows? Uh, oh, how I am showing only five rows? Yeah. Uh, did I get the question uh, right? Uh, you are asking how I got five rows? Yeah, uh, how you oh, got okay. five rows using. Right, that's important. Uh, here I'm doing head. Head is a function, it only shows you the first few lines. But if I remove this head, you see, if it will show you everything. But it is not convenient to show a huge data set, maybe, you are lucky here that you have only 200 points. What if it has 10,000, then this whole notebook will be filled up. So in order to quickly examine as a data scientist, sure, you get the idea. It's just to get the idea, right? So next, you need to do something called scatter plot. So you have, let's go back to the relationship with the data. So you would like to know what impact sales. Is it the TV? radio or a newspaper you know, budget, what impacts. So as a result, what you should do is that plot them individually, sales with newspaper, sales with radio, sales with TV, how different data points look like. And that's what here you are doing. Here you are saying that I want three plots 
one plot divided into three, that's what one comma three sub, sub, sub plot, share y will have the same axis called sales here, you see, share y axis, and it's called scatter plot. This is a function you can use when I share my notebook, you can use it. So as a data scientist, you'd be like, let me see how it looks. So you are saying, I want scatter type of plot. This is called scatter plot with all the dots. X should be TV. Well, that you get from here because the data, when you read it, it has all these different columns. So for a scatter plot, you need X variable and Y variable. For the X, you give TV. For the Y, you give the sales and take it from the data, data itself, right? Data object, which has all the data. And X axis should be A0 because you have three plots here, the three X axis, zero, one, two. And that's what it says. Please plot that axis and figure size should be this many. You can make this figure smaller or bigger by changing it. Say I can make it 20, uh, these scatter plots. So it's a little bit bigger, right? Wider size, this size is bigger. So I'm just, <clears throat> similarly, you do the next plot. And this plot here, the first one is the plot. So it's plotting sales and TV. Look at the TV x-axis. Uh, y -axis, x axis is TV. It says, and what do you get? So sales is this. So as you spend more and more on TV, it looks like there is an increase in sales. Of course, there is not a, like a linear relation, relationship like V equal to IR, but there is a trend. And that's what you are going to get as a data scientist. You are not going to say, see all these things in a nice line. Your job is to figure out what is the best function or formula that fits it. Now let's plot right next to it, radio and sales. See, radio on this axis, as I'm sending radio, I do see that it increases sales, but I'm not sure beyond the point it matters, you see. You said spend more, yeah, it does increase, but there are still points where it didn't impact much. But there is a trend. But I see that relationship more in TV. TV seems to impact more. Newspaper, let's look at the newspaper. That's this one. Newspaper is all over the place. See, even if you have spent 80, still some are not very high. And even if you did not spend much on newspaper, say lower zero to 20, still you get all kinds of sales. That looks like newspaper does not have much importance. So you and I are now going to believe for now that looks like TV has the most impact, radio has least impact, newspaper has maybe a little bit lesser impact. So now what I'm going to do is that let's do a simple formula. Maybe we can see if this is, there is a formula here I can fit. Simplest formula is a straight line. What is the straight line relationship? Y equal to MX plus C. These are in your higher 10 plus two level. This was C, this was your M slope of the line. And you call it here beta zero and beta one. These are the regression coefficient. So I'm going to fit this line and see if we can, what would be a best fit for this formula? Maybe this is a good fit. This would be a poor fit. Even this will be even more poor. So the idea is that these are your points, these black dots. What we want to do is that this is a line, the blue line is the line actually. Somehow suppose you knew the formula and we are going to compute this thing. So let me explain it on the board now. So now we know that our errors are coming from X. Okay, so let's, any questions so far? Feel free to ask, this is a good time. This is one of the most important technique you will learn in life you can use anywhere, even to project your IT budget, even when you become a manager or if you are already from data.
So here, here is what we have. I have an axis and you can call it X, Y. X, Y. In our case, it is TV, say. TV budget and this is the sales. And suppose these are our data sets. They are never on a nice line. Okay. So now we ourselves ask, is it possible that there is a formula, straightforward formula? Then your question is, what is the formula? I am saying that I want a formula like this. X beta one plus beta zero. Remember from the 10 plus two, equation of a line is equal to y equal to m x plus c. This c when m is zero, um, it, it, this is the intercept. So now let's see how can we fit a line. This is called regression. So if there is a formula of this, but I don't know what beta one and beta zero is. So what is a reasonable thing to do here? Well, one intuition tells me that this formula should be somehow I would like this thing to go somewhere right through the middle. This is what I would like things to go through. But that is my visual. How does an algorithm find out what is the right beta one, beta zero? Now let's look at this. Suppose I found this formula. Suppose somebody gave me magically. When x is zero, what's the value? Let's look at it. When x is zero, y is x beta plus beta zero. This is zero, I'm left with beta zero. So this must be beta zero value. Okay. What is this? It's a slope, right? We know that from geometry that beta one is essentially the slope. How do you get that? Take any two points here. Because this is a formula, let's call it y2, x2, y1, x1. The slope is the difference divided by in this by that that's the slope that difference is y2 minus y1 y2 minus y1 and that is x2 minus x1 and now you can actually substitute the values here so this is x1 so y2 is what and y1 is what? Well, we know if this is the formula, if this data was to respect, which it does not by the way, they're not a way, I'm still in the ideal world, my fantasy world. So y2 would be the corresponding value of x1 because if you know x2, you can from this formula look up y2. So what is this actually? So that is beta one x2 plus beta zero minus beta one x one plus beta zero. This one remains x two x one. What happens here? This is negative, this is positive, this beta zero, this beta zero is going to cancel out. X two x one will remain. So beta one x two minus beta one x1 divided by x2 minus x1 beta 1 I pull out common this cancel cancels I'm left with beta 1 so this slope is beta 1 so that's the idea so now who will give me beta 1 and beta 0 I need an algorithm and this is where we need our math. All right, so let's, uh, Neil, are you there? Yes. 
Are you understanding? Just uh, I'm uh, using you as a benchmark. Like, is this clear enough? Anything, the letters, what I'm writing? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Um, again, anyone feel free to stop me anytime. Somia? Yes, yes, Kishori, it's very much clear. I have one question. Sure. Does the line of regression, the line, whatever we draw, right. does it always has, will pass the point X mean and Y mean? Uh, say it again. Does the line of regression yes. will pass through the point X comma Y? I mean, X mean and Y mean? Yes. It, yes. It, I mean, that's the rule. It has to pass through X mean and Y mean. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, oh, I see. That is a very good question, actually, Somia. Um, that is interesting. Maybe not, actually. We will see. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> we'll find out. That's interesting. Your yeah, question. and one more thing I, I was thinking is, does the line also find the average of the Y? Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, let me think. If I put X mean, Ah, okay, great. So let's see. I mean, it, it, does it pass through the point of sample averages? That's what right, I right, mean, right. Of X and Y. Right. So let's see now. So if I have a formula, let's say, so if I have X mean, it will be mean, yes, it will go through it. Always. Yes. I mean, a perfect Always. line, a regression line. Yes. Okay. Always. Yeah. So, I mean, is there anything that we can prove this, any blog or something? I mean, I know that by yes, a certain you step. can. I will come to, I'll prove it for yes, you. Yes, okay. Okay, great. So, what Somia raised the question is that, is the average of X random variable, not the sample average? Now, I want to tell you one thing. X is coming from somewhere, Y is coming from somewhere, and there is a regression. So these are, for now, we have not added the random component and I'm going to add that random component. Remember, we assume when we computed V equal to IR, there is some unknown noise comes from somewhere. We'll come to that now. But for now, before I explain that, my goal is to draw a line as closely as possible that goes through the middle and it looks reasonable. Now you might ask, what is reasonable? A reasonable, you can have many different, many definitions of being a reasonable regression. And this comes to the heart of the matter that how do you get beta one and beta zero? Well, all you know is that if you know beta one and beta zero somehow for this line, game over, you know everything. Here is the rules. So first, look at your data points, or these are called sample points, okay? Sample points, because you plotted it here, sample points. Now, look at this sample point. It is almost on the line, but it is off by something. This is off by this. This is off the Y. It is always the Y that is messed up, you see? X is X, you cannot change it. But it is always going away from the Y value is messed up. If I can adjust Y, so how many points do I have? Let us call it we will name them as x1, this is x2, this is x3, it's x3 value, x4, x5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, say, x11, great. But I also have, because I'm plotting it, these x12 values, they also have a y value, right? So say I collect y values, sure, y2, x4, y4, these are my points that I collect from my data set, sales TV data, Y11, so on. So to give you an example. So you look up the row. This is one of the points, right? Where this is the TV expenditure number and this is the sales, any point. So we have 200 points. So there will be 200 of them. So you always treat the TV value as X, sales as Y. Why X and Y, you might ask? Well, TV value is that depend, it is the independent variable because you choose to spend that as a, I don't know, marketing person, you, it is in your control. Sales is the outcome that comes out that you don't have control over. But don't go to randomness yet, okay? 
don't think of random variables. Just think that this is a relationship. More you sell, so if you spend something on TV, you will get a benefit in sales. And we think it's positive. If beta is negative, the curve will be down. Then it will imply more you spend on TV, your sales would go down actually. But this is going up. So now I'm on my way to determining what beta one and beta zero ones. Well, note that all of these points would have been going through the line if there was no error. So what I want, I want a compromise. This is the regression line. We are regressing, that means regression line. Regressing to it, a compromise, which one? My rule is this. I want a line where I compute from each point, sample point, these are called sample points, the y, for example, this value, whatever value that delta y11 is, say, and this is x10, y10, and whatever that delta y10, this is delta y, I don't know, 8, delta y8, all of them, all of these off errors. I want to add, square them and add them up. So this delta i, i goes from 1 to 11 because I have 11 points here on the screen. So let's call it 11. Square them so that, see, look at this. This is negative, right? Oh, this is here. It's uh, always this minus this. So it's negative. For this, it's positive. This minus this. It's a convention. Some are positive, some are negative. So I square them so that they all become positive. And I ask, fix a line so that this line will be as minimum as possible. What does it mean by that? Well, this is what I'm asking. Suppose I draw another candidate for beta one and beta two. Maybe this line would go like this, but then it would be terrible, see? Look at this, his, this delta. Then this delta y would be over here, much bigger, much bigger, much bigger, much bigger, much bigger, smaller, bigger. But if you square there, let's call it primed, okay? This one is the call primed. Other choice. So if you do this, you would notice that delta y primed, I'm using the prime, I square, this number would be a lot bigger because this line is way impractical. It doesn't even make sense. So there is a difference between this line and this line. This line, these all these errors that you square up for the y would be bigger. So I would like a line where such that beta one and beta zero should have values. This error, if I plot like this, would be as little as possible. And I want the best such guy who has the least, least error, error in this case. Um, let me wait here for a minute or two. Maybe it's a good time to discuss a little bit more the intuition. Do you have any question? Feel free to ask any question. Neil? Yes. <clears throat> any questions? Is it clear? Right. Yes. Um, what, anything uh, needs clarification? <coughs> Hello, uh, Kishori. Yes, uh, Rajesh. Uh, uh, just a normal question, actually. So, if you want to become a data science, whether we need to learn all these formulas, all this uh, statistics, everything, whether we need to. No, you don't need to. Your software will do it. You should just learn the concept. Concepts. Uh, it's okay. not important to learn formula. Okay. So, hi, Kishore. Yes. Uh, uh, Vigesh, so yes. This is Vigne. Yeah. Hi, for me, this is very hard to understand. So something I understand, something I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. So for a, can you give any uh, simple example to understand these uh, probabilities and statistics? Yes. Because basically I'm a programmer, but uh, I can't, uh, so for max, uh, so a little bit is very hard to understand this formulas and everything. Sure, okay. So um, I will make, uh, yeah. So let me, um, yeah, absolutely. We'll give examples. So essentially, 
what we want is a simple formula and you have something say you have say um, IT related say project say number of projects does it equal to number of people say what is the right amount or let me see so let's stick with advertisement so my I'm thinking is that if I have two things one is the thing I control the other thing is the outcome I get in this case I can control my TV expenditure I'm the manager and I'm going to project sales why do I need to project because I want to know how much money I should spend to get my sales up say you give me a target say hey your project should be I have a budget of say 40,000 rupees how much sales can you get but how do I know all I need is a formula simple formula this is, sales is something I don't know it's not in my control it's something that happens uh, I cannot tell you the uh, one cannot tell you the future but this is a prediction so the idea is that you plug in in this formula a value that you have you can control and that will give you the prediction so linear regression is used for predicting so and also to describe dependence of one type of parameter to another type of parameter and it's for <clears throat> prediction so the way you want to do is that you want a line that plots through it right in the middle but as you know from the programming point of view how do i plot how do i calculate the method this is called least square least means minimum least square error least square error. and all you need to know if you are in real life you need my notebook and you say okay let me read the table in and let me put the um, call the library and it will actually plot through you for you nicely and that's what you need in actual real life I'm giving you only background to get you intuition that it's called least square uh, Neil any suggestion uh, yeah so far so good so also Bigness, I want to say that this projection you do there is no guarantee that it will be hundred percent accurate but you still need a educated guess and this doesn't mean that this formula is controlling you know TV budget to sales directly it is an indication it is a trend so you should think of it in that way <clears throat> and um, so okay however there are a lot of flaws in it maybe it depends on the season X depends on the season uh, Y, you know then I have not captured here just putting money will not help you so that we need a longer formula maybe it depends on this that several things in the formula so let me show you on the screen uh, how to get what are the values I get and that's where as a data scientist your job is over you get beta 0 beta 1 and then there are some results it spits out metrics are these good enough how good it is and you there you go your job is done as a data scientist you can give it to the marketing team so let me share my screen now so okay so those betas are called coefficients so what I'm doing is that I'm taking this this is not something you need to memorize you need to have it once in your notebook because there are only like 10 10 15 techniques you should have this and get spit it out like uh, when somebody needs you look at this i'm doing a sales and tv formula and i'm saying that tv uh, budget has an impact on sales why well maybe these plots uh, okay i'm sorry i should i forgot to share the screen um, share screen. Okay, so here, look at this. I'm plotting it. This is easy. This is you do one time and you just, uh, you know, memorize. And then you plot this and you are like, look, 
as I am increasing TV, look at the values where TV advertisement budget is high. Look at the x-axis, go to higher values. Look at the corresponding values. Are they high in sales? Looks like it has a trend. Look at radio here, the second one. And uh, sales kind of increases, but some of them still are small, low sales. Downward is small. Now, let's look at the formula. This is the formula, X is our sales, Y is, no, X is our TV, Y is our sales. And I go through all these math. This I just showed you so that you know this. This is all you need to know. This is the holy grail. I'm saying that fit, fit sales data with TV data. This is the formula, that's it. And these are the values. Look at it. So after these values, essentially, this is the value you are getting. Y0 data. So you see, it automatically spits out these two numbers for you, this software. So essentially, these are the four lines you should know. And it spits out for you. And here is a formula, I give it to the marketing guy. Then he's asking that, hey, what happens if I spend $50,000? You plug in X equal to 50, which is the sales. Here you go. You'll get sales of say 9 million. And that's it, as simple as that. This is where you are projecting. Say if somebody says, hey, if I get 100, how much will it be? Oh, 11 million. Doesn't mean it's double, why? Because sales only impacts 0 0.04. This is a factor. This is a coefficient. It does not in suddenly double for you. <clears throat> so that is the idea of plotting. Now we have found a relationship between that TV impacts 0 0.04 only this much in the sales. Even if you do zero, say zero, no, I don't want to spend any money at all on sales. See, you can say seven. So now you see, as a manager, you can decide how much you want to uh, invest on it. Because you see, for sending zero, you still got seven million uh, sales, and by sending ten thousand, you got seven point five. So you can think if it makes sense to you or that sales. So this is where the data scientist stops. So you give them the projection. This is called prediction. You are able to predict with your formula. First, you took the data. This is called fitting the model. You are building the model and fitting the model and you are predicting. And this is where the data scientist job often ends. Any question here? Okay. Yes. So now I want to yeah, plot yeah, this yeah. line. Yes, Kishori. I, yes. Think, I think many of the, you know, uh, just some kind of general uh, observations probably. Uh, many of the participants are primarily from an IT background. Uh -huh. So many must be thinking why we are doing all this in-depth level of statistics and what is the role that all these underlying stats and maths plays here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know, many, many of the assumptions are that, you know, it's more about Spark and all those kind of things when it's normally we talk about here in India about data science. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a fine line of differences between the data science and the data engineering. I think if you can explain, I, I know you explained on the last class, but still you can explain why we are doing all this, you know, little rigorous level of statistics so that, you know, it can be kind of given a sure. fair idea that why we are going into this level of yeah. statistics probably. Yeah. So, yeah. So data science has several aspects. One is pure IT maintenance and data scientists who makes models. And these models, you don't have to invent. You have to be able to use it. A model that is already known. There are about 10 to 15 models I can think of. So people will come to you with a data set and say, can you predict this model or fit this model? Fitting a model means essentially finding a, starting up with a simple equation and estimating these parameters. These are called parameters. You get the parameter value. Uh, or for example, this could be a neural network. In this case, it will be neural network weights. 
say maybe that data set you feed in new data set and it can give you some question maybe you show a picture it can identify who what is in that picture or you can feed in a data it can recognize your voice or you say something it can say he you are you know all these automated voice recognition system this kind of so for this there is no one formula that explains everything easily so that is but these methods you cannot write with if else logic you need some kind of math or statistics to be able to capture this intuition and then program it because you cannot program if else or you cannot train a if else network so these will help you to your goal should be to which model to run and the algorithm is already done for you you feed in the data and it automatically trains itself and then now you can use that model anywhere and that is the idea of this so what i am planning to do i'm thinking maybe next class is that take some data sets and predict it's more of a use case what do you think uh, neil yes that's a good idea uh, yeah i mean because it's maybe also the reasons that you know uh, most of the participants has left their maths and statistics probably at a very long ago mm -hmm. so it's kind of kind of little coming out of the comfort zone probably i see okay that's so that is okay so um what i think is that um next week for some time we will just simply fit data we will take data set ask a question and run a algorithm that is already there in the data science library and get the results what do you think about that approach yeah participants uh, that should be fine but yes mm -hmm. I, I personally believe that this level of maths and stat is highly required to at least kind of get an intuition and you know kind of predicts or right. kind of an idea to the data science right. yeah so yeah no i I'm, i might give some of you guys uh, feel free to ask questions and some of you guys should give definitely feedback so that i can tailor it um yeah, can your... i can i say something to kishori i mean to answer uh, neel is it fine mhm mm okay uh, to become a data engineer i know i mean it is really like easy that's what i can say but data scientist it's really difficult you really have to understand the math behind it otherwise it's going to be a black box any model will be going to be a black box we will not understand anything what it is going to i mean see python will be doing everything but unless you understand the math behind it you will not be able to understand anything so that's the reason <clears throat> i i mean that's really good to show you are explaining the math behind it and if at all really people are having trouble then i think uh, what about excel right X, i see yeah. excel i mean give some data and then uh, maybe using that if people are comfortable using excel otherwise just give only <clears throat> one independent variable and one dependent variable and ask them to predict so that it will be easy to understand linear regression of course mm -hmm. i mean why it is useful and how it will work out then it makes a very good sense that's what i feel that's what mm -hmm. i that's where i have learned i mean that's where i have taken the path to learn actually mm -hmm. right that's a very excellent feedback actually this would be a part of the assignments you know uh, but yes i mean that, that's a good, very good feedback yeah right. and one more thing is really if at all i mean uh, um, uh, i'm just thinking about the participants also i know this what this is what i had also faced when it was the first class of my data science so uh, now i'm i'm started working on it but but i want to understand even more deep math that's the reason i have joined this class so for rest of the participants who don't, i mean who don't know what i am and i mean why i have joined and uh, what i'm doing and uh, <clears throat> i would say neil if at all i mean you have given the uh, information but uh, if at all you can give us uh, to go through the blog for rest of the people what you will be referring they'll do one <coughs> sorry one research and then when you speak this word discrete continuous it will i know it will bounce off so they'll uh, it will see it will take time to sink in into your brain keep what is discrete what is continuous and what is normal central limit theorem there are so many things so many new words that are coming up so people can't relate see this mm -hmm. was my experience now when neil is saying that's what i can relate it right i see your point yes so that is something we will address it um i will prepare in a way that uh 
it is more natural and more kind of connects to yeah bridges better right yes i agree thank you so much uh, those no, are great no, points I, I, I did uh, no no i did not say but you are doing it really very good we have to come to that level i mean you can't go even more granular level i think you are doing it really very uh, in a very low level i can i can see that uh, but we have to pick it up we i mean right. people have to come up to that level so for that i think a little bit of study maybe blogs or share something so that before your class say, yeah. we'll understand what we are you are talking so that's an excellent point so that is somia uh, thank you for bringing it up and i'm going to share my jupiter notebook please please all of you try to generate some random numbers hit them and see and i'll simplify i will give you like say three discrete random variable examples two continuous and you just play with those jupiter notebook kishori right kishori i i think what she trying to say that you know before uh, participants coming to the class if you can just refer to some blogs or some i will do that books i will do that so they can so, at least get frequented with an idea what we are going to talk about so now what she's referring that you know like the things are getting like you know kind of it's getting very like a, like let's say you are you are from a real background suddenly been to uk and they speak in a very fancy english like it sounds very fancy but you are not able to you know really get into their flow so that that's what she mean like i need uh, this is jatinder here yes yeah, satinder yeah so i am very newbie to this data science thing and mm -hmm. uh, my i was one i mean i basically want to learn like detail behind everything behind data science and what is the artificial intelligence which is going up in the market so mm -hmm. in that sense but yeah i am not able to take much of the things but uh, yeah but this will clarify but it's not going exactly in the brain what exactly your mean to say so right. just, uh, so that's what i where i am lacking to understand the things but uh, what i think is that uh how can be this can be understood by the simple example of life i mean where this formula exactly fits in okay so now the one thing you explain about the four columns tv uh tv there was mm -hmm. three of right tv, TV newspaper radio yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah tv newspaper radio and the sales so mm -hmm. when the da data which displays out actually that was in the jupiter and basically that the column sales falls down in the last part mm -hmm. so how we need to figure out that this sales would be the why or it can be anything yeah mm -hmm. is if somebody is tell that the yeah why would be a sales okay let's now then we will like i mean i mean then i will understand that okay this is the why uh, i have to take as a sales so that's the thing i didn't understand right. that, that point of is and, very important and, yes and, yeah and also the thing is like a uh, small small thing of the even the coding part i don't know python uh, completely mm -hmm. but yeah i can understand the programming levels of it so in that uh, plotting the things yeah but that will gradually come to know but the very basic things which uh, would make a sense for me to understand or anybody right. so right. i think that will clarify right jatinder okay just to give you just to tell you that mm -hmm. when you talk about this ai machine learning so mm -hmm. these are essentially boils down to mathematics and statistics See, this mm -hmm. sounds very fancy but that's right. the reality so new yeah. i have a comment so the fact that you are actually uh, somia or jatinder or you are giving is essentially i consider it as a part of our discussion in class jatinder you ask a question mm -hmm. uh, and this is exactly what would help mm -hmm. us to make the class more understandable now that you mentioned mm -hmm. sales and tv what's the relationship which one is y which one is x mm -hmm. and that's a good time to actually talk about it and feel free to anyone uh, to step in and what jatinder just pointed out a question and this is yeah, what we should use the opportunity to discuss let's yeah. talk about it yes yeah. so, and uh... so mia yeah yeah kishore i mean just a thought oh. again because yeah. everyone all of us has to pull up also so yes. why don't why don't i mean before coming for the uh, uh, class itself because okay. see now uh, everyone shouldn't say that yes i did not understand i don't understand so for them to uh, i mean they also have to study mm -hmm. your when you are doing your part we also have to do our part so mm -hmm. some um, assignment or something or some test before attending the class the previous class previous weeks whatever has happened just a few 10 questions if at all you can give us sure 
I, I, if at all, it is not much difficult. So that, that we will not uh, give an excuse. Um, I know what what happens usually when we go for work. So no, we'll, no, that's 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 absolutely very justified. That is very good point. So I'm going to send questions, and we can use it to discuss because I myself learn through discussions, like interesting <laughs> questions, like what Somia had asked, what Jatinder had asked. I myself answered, and we should continue even even today's class. So now. X and Y is actually, it might look like a simple question. It's a very interesting question that will help you elsewhere, everywhere. So in any kind of data science, when you see X and Y, you should ask yourself, what are the variables or aspects that are coming in? And let me explain a little bit. And this is, we'll revisit later, but I want to address this aspect. And this will help all of you. how to think about it because it's quite likely you might get confused if I give you some problem. So I give you something image that comes from somewhere independently. And your goal is to tell me what is in the image. And my goal is automation. What is in the image is I'm trying to make the computer do that for me or the algorithm do it for me. The result, question, this is always the X. And the result you are looking for to figure out, find, is this is the answer you are looking for. Now let's go back to sales and PV data. Here is a question I'm going to ask. Sales, PV, X-Men, VSR, and radio, right? And I don't tell you. I, I just give you these columns. And I'm a very bad teacher, suppose. And I tell you, Ravi, go ahead and uh, do some regression on it. Have fun. Ravi would be like, what do you want to do? I say, I don't have time to tell you. So now, as a data scientist, you should think, what is the meaning of this probabilities model? If the manager tells you that I'm trying to see if I should spend more money on my TV or radio or newspaper, it's, uh, that's what I'm trying to find out. So you will say, can you control sales? Then the manager will say, sales is not something in my control. That happens. I cannot control. Usually, values that you can control or that you supply are X. I'm writing X with a bold because there are three aspects. So it's a, essentially, it's a X1, X2, X3. Anyone can be X1. I just choose to do X1, X2. These are just names. And the sales is something that happens. I believe that my, this guy has some influence on the sales. That's how we have to think. So can sales be X and PV be budget? Well, you never predict. I mean, just by looking at the sales, there could be situations where you are trying to guess, oh, I'm trying to see how much they must have sent, spent in PV budget, but it's a known quantity. You control it as a businessman. There's no need to guess, but there are situations where sales is something that you can control, maybe artificially, and this is something you are trying to guess. As a general rule of thumb, things that are hard to understand that is not in your control should be why. And the things that you think affects this should be your X. That's why it's called independent variable. This happens independently. And this is the dependent. So there is some influence of this on this. Now, somebody tells you that a neural network, build a neural network that recognizes voice. You know, like nowadays these Android phones have these voice recognitions. You say one, two, your credit card number, it understands. This is the result. Why? Why should be zero, one, two, all the digits. And this is the voice file, MP4 file mp4 file or mp3 file that is the x so now what is x and mp3 file let's tell me let's let me tell you what is in how can image be an x file well an image you should think of it this way it has a bunch of squares depending on the resolution let's say 100 by 100 think of it 100 by 100 so you have 100 rows 1 through 100 100 columns 
this is an x variable. So each one, this capital X essentially has many, many values, 100 by 100, 10,000 values, x1, x2, x10,000. I write it with bold, often people like to write bold. This is a vector essentially. This is an image and each of them has a value between zero and 255 for a black and white. Uh, these, these are the values. So you should think of the whole X as a, some function and Y is something you can recognize. What is Y? It's a cat or a dog or a human being. Uh, this is the data science problem. So your data is always one independent that comes from outside and you are trying to predict something. But before you predict, you have to build this model, train him. Uh, any other question? This is something you have to keep in mind. Always identify the X that way. Something that comes from outside. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So think about it. Any other question? These are very interesting questions. Uh, Kashopi, any question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is just for my understanding. Uh, I mean, uh, as a data scientist, what we get is the data, like the one we fetched from the net. So we try to plot it uh, like we did uh, a scatter plot. Mm -hmm. And uh, after plotting, uh, we have to analyze. I mean, we have to know that uh, which algorithm we have to uh, to yes. make a predictive analysis, right? That's Absolutely. what we do. Absolutely. Okay. So now let me walk you guys through a thought process. Mm -hmm. So, and this is not just for your understanding, it's for all of our understanding. Please do not hold back questions, please fire away. And now I'm going to again, look at the TV data, right? And I'm going to think like, suppose I'm in the Kashyapi's position and I don't understand. I see these data sets, what am I supposed to do? As a data scientist, what I'm going to look at is that are the data even reasonable? So let's go and take a look at it on the screen. So, okay. So when I, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so I should first, before, I directly jump to scatter plot. In the next class, I'm going to look at even more detail. So here I did plot sales and TV. Or I can even do this. Okay, so here is, I'm, Neil, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, it's okay. clear. This is very important. So I got this data and I have no clue. I'm a data scientist. I just got my job today and you are telling me, can you project my sales? You are the manager. I'm confused. I look at this data set. I'm like, oh God. So I look at radio data. Oh, then I look at newspaper data. Then I look at sales data. So how do I know how much even, you know, this data has any meaning? So at the first plot, what we will do some, I will show an example. This I will work through a full report, how a data scientist thinks. First, I'm going to analyze TV expenditures. How much does it spend? What does TV look like? I'm going to look at the TV. I'm going to calculate their mean distribution. Then I'm going to look at, so this is a TV, I see that Ah, they spend all over the place. The range is very large. So then I'm going to look at radio. Let's see, again, I forgot what it is. I do it again. Okay, radio. Okay. So radio data are numbers are small. Some are very small, some are large. Okay. So then I'm going to look at newspaper similarly. Okay. This I'm going to revisit next time because I need to prepare some materials for you so that you can actually tell the story. For now, think about this way. So now you ask yourself, what are the independent variables? Of course, probably TV. 
radio newspaper sales because sales is a it's a product it, it's not something i can control that's why sales is a y variable okay why do you need this model probably you are trying to predict something sales Bec and as a data scientist you have always have to have that uh, use that common sense that sales is something is important for a business you have you guys are all you know experienced people you know that how important sales is for a business now i want to see what drives sales is it tv is it radio it's newspaper well let me show on the board well uh, and feel free to argue and talk that's how we learn so my question is now i'm confused now right so I'm, I'm a data scientist, I'm in my first day of job, and I need to solve this problem. So I know now, sales is it matters. I have budget in radio, TV, and newspaper. So my first point is that, is, this, is there at all, at all a dependence? How do I know? Maybe there is no dependence. What I'm going to do is that the first plot, which I'm going to share later, this is sales always because it's a dependent variable this is the y and this is tv i take those points because somehow i already have data from sales and tv where did they come from now you might ask they might have your marketing research guy might have collected they might have looked at other businesses and collected this data as a data scientist you should know that you should always look for data that is like your business of course in your case you don't have every possible data that's why you need to be here to predict so you use others experience as a knowledge in your model so that's where that data set came from so now you are asking that all the data i have seen before is there any relationship how do i know maybe as i increase tv sales maybe sales shoot up through the sky or maybe it does not matter much very slowly because you don't have a formula what you do is that whatever data points you have from the table sales and tv you take that as y1 x1 y2 x2 keep plotting these values this is called scatter plot So as a data scientist, you should know scatter plot. And that's why I'm going to give you the full project of this TV. We will take this data seriously and analyze it thoroughly, all aspects, okay. so that you learn all the tools. <clears throat> scatter plot is this is called scatter. Things are scattered. So what pattern do I see? Kind of if TV increases, if I companies that have spent more on TV seem to have good amount of sales increasing. What about him? Not so much. Why? Well, data science is about real data. And real data, often there will be always outliers. These are called outliers. They don't have to fit your model because you don't know what the actual model is. So you look at it, look at it for, and use common sense here. Completely feel free to use common sense. You don't have to be rigid like a algorithm, you know? Think about it. Well, I see that you got, there's a movie I could recommend you. It was came out some time ago. How this Wall Street guy makes money by observing the data points. And that you should make a habit by freely think about it. So I see that there is an increase. Increase. Wow. You'll say that it looks like interesting. Well, what about radio? Let's look at radio data. You, you do the same kind of plot, okay? Same sales, same radio. Here are the points. What is this? I'm increasing my sales, uh, radio, uh, you know, advertising, and sale is like not going up as much. Doesn't looks like I don't think there is any profitable dependence. Even if radio increases, radio budget is the same. 
What about newspaper? Let's look at it this way. And this is how I'm teaching you how to think like a data scientist. This is sales. And now this is newspaper. Well, this definitely seemed to increase. This kind of newspaper kind of sort of increasing. I'm not sure radio has any influence. So how many of you are willing to think that which of these three expenditures do you think is the most reasonable if you are a manager? Any thoughts by looking at these behaviors on sales? Yeah, definitely the TV. Yeah, the TV because it steeply increases as I expand. Which one is the least useful, do you think? Not as useful. I guess radio. Radio. You would not waste time, right, on radio. Well, so the goal is that, and your manager is saying that, look, I'm going to spend anyway 50 on radio, TV 60, uh, TV, and then 20 on newspaper. He has this budget. And you are like, I'm already going to spend, budget is allocated. How much do you think sales is? And you don't know. You are like, okay, I see 60 in sale here, but radio also has some influence, maybe bad or good, I don't know. Newspaper has some impact. They have to add up, right? Yes, TV alone, I'm getting a little bit good, but they have some impact. So I would like to have a formula like this. Why? Some, some, even if you spend zero, you will still get some sales. That's why this is for that. Amount of TV. This is radio. And radio plus beta three is newspaper. So what you would expect is that TV to be a large number, big slope. So you'd expect maybe, I don't know, some pick a number, say 10. B, B2 is a radio. It has no impact, maybe if possible negative. Maybe it will actually give you 0.1, slightly going down. Beta 3, newspaper has some positive impact. Maybe 3. So now, essentially, what you got here yourself is a formula. Here, a formula. The formula would be here. Y, beta, you have to fit it for a model. You got one. So your formula would be one plus 10 TV plus minus 0.1 radio plus three newspaper. So now your boss says, this is what I have spent. You just plug in this TV 60, radio 50 here, and 20 newspaper, and you get your number. So if this is how much you spend, your projection will be uh, one plus 10 times 60 is the TV, 0.1 times radio is 50 plus three times 20. So whatever you get that number, that would be your Y. So this is like uh, 600 plus one, 601. So this is point, I don't know, five, 60, some 660 or something. So that is your projection. So that's how you use it. So you looked at the data, you plot it, and you use linear regression, only that library two command I use, and you get these numbers and you predict. So that is you will do as a data scientist. I might okay. be able to show you a little bit more about how to plot these things. That would be useful to you all. Okay, Kishori, uh, maybe yeah. also the manager uh, might want uh, like how much money I should put in TV or right. radio yeah. so that I get the maximum sales mm -hmm. like that. Yes, absolutely. So you will say, 
Well, beta is high. Put here because you'll get maximum money. Then your TV radio might say, hey, you know, are you laying us off? We need at least this minimum budget of five. Then you give them as little as possible and give them more. And you will get high Y, high sales. That's how you will decide. And if he has full freedom, he would be like, in fact, let's not spend anything on radio and newspaper. Let's focus on TV. So it is for general trend. As a data scientist, you will make this report and give it to your manager or CEO, and he will make the decision. Pradeep, any question? Yeah, no, I'm sure. Sure. Sorry, I'm okay. Hungry. Thank you. Jatinder? Yeah, understood. Okay. So uh, this, is, this brings us to uh, almost the end of linear regression. Feel free to ask more questions. Uh, I don't want to unnecessarily drag you out in one day, but I want to make these reports myself and send it over to you. And then we all look at it and ask questions. Yeah. So, but in the meantime, keep asking any question, any doubts you have. There is no stupid question. There's only a stupid answer. So I would be the stupid person if I cannot answer. Actually, there is no stupid answer. Maybe it's a discussion. Nobody knows everything. Um, any other thoughts, Neil? Uh, Chiranjit, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. When we talk about model, when you say uh, we are fitting a model, does it mean we are actually fitting an equation, an uh, exact uh, formula? That right. Uh, that is excellent question. So when you fit a model, it is essentially fitting a formula or a algorithm. And a model does not mean need to be the cause. In this case, all we have done is fitted a model. Why TV increases, TV advertisement spending increases sales? That is called causation, reason, right? That is economist's job, that is not my job. And that's why we fit model. We do not know the reason, which is called causation, cause and effect. Most of the data science, causation is not our problem. We are not trying to find out why it's happening. We are trying to just fit. And yeah, again, sorry. go ahead. Yeah, just, yeah, just adding to his, this question. So that a, for any, any set of data, when you kind of analyze or you try to predict something, so which particular model of model will fit into that kind of data? That decision yeah. comes from the data scientists, right? Right. So that you will get an idea by making this scatter plot sort of things. If the data is simple. But if it is an image, you will have to see what is in that image. Is the image very blurry? Then you will have to use neural networks. There are certain data types that are suitable for certain models or certain models suitable for certain data set. And that we will see. But for most of these tabular kind of data set, this regression will make many, most people happy. After we master regression, then we'll go for other clustering things. But regression is everywhere in data science. It's the first step we will do. And it will solve 70% of your problem. In fact, if you go for an interview and you say that you know regression reasonably well, you are a data scientist already. Chiranjit, did I answer your question correctly? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so any other question, Neil, feel free to ask questions because this will inspire others to kind of ask more questions, think in different directions. Uh, yes, the other set of question is that like, let's say, you know, like, um, you know, let's say you have a set of data or probably a set of images. So how someone comes to a conclusion, say that, okay, I should apply neural network kind of algorithm or kind of that methods or plain regression or plain Gaussian. So how that intuition comes, uh, is it come with a work experience or it's just right. by learning? Uh, it's by seeing a few cases. Like in this class, if I show you like 15 cases, 
which I showed one, most of the things are 99% are going to be from those 15 cases. 10 to 15 cases. It's not many, many variations. All of those are minor variations. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, for example, when somebody gives you image data, well, you look at how many variables are X. In image, you saw I had 10,000. There is no way I can fit a regression model or look at one by one. So natural thing comes to mind, neural network. When you see many, many dependent, although image itself is one object, but think about it, every pixel is a different, you can look at it as a vector of many, many features, 10,000. X1, X2 through X10,000. This is going to be your, these many variables. Here you have only three variables, TV, newspaper, radio. And image has 10,000 variables. These are suitable for neural networks and support vector machines, which is another form of algorithm. Right. Um, so yeah, the more the number of these variables, I think it often makes you think that you should use neural net. We will, we will do it later training with images and voice recognition, for example. Yeah, I have one more doubt. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, we use a scatter plot, right? So how do we even uh, decide on that? We could have used a histogram or something right. like that. That's a good idea. That's a good question. So histogram you would use when you want to use, look at sales, like sales itself, not as a relation. Here, a scatter plot is trying to give you a relation between X and Y, a trend, right? But say you want to only know about sales, like are sales data really well represented, spread out, all kinds of sales data. So you will make histogram. Histogram is for one variable. When you look at two variables, relationship, then you do scatter. And scatter plot you'd use when you have a limited number of variables like this, like one, two, three, or 15, but not too many. And Kishore, can we plot the scatter chart in a one? I mean, now we have plotted the individual scatters. Right. So yes. Can, can we plot into one single thing? Unfortunately, no. Uh, that's why uh, we. So, scatter plot is called, these are called descriptive way of analyzing, right? So, mm -hmm. that you can do for one pair at a time. But now we know that things can depend on all three. Ideally, I should be able to plot in a higher dimensional space because it's not you cannot visualize or interpret. That's where regression comes in. This formula solves you everything. All you walk away is with this beta. So, you know, just as an example, today, many of the aeroplanes drive, fly automatically. Not the pilots are not driving like a car, right? Where is the eye? Because in real life, we are used to using our senses the machine become their senses, right? The, all the control system. So in data science, when things get out of control like that, all we have to live with is this formula. I, because, and you spit out the beta variables and say, this is the dependence. I cannot show you everything. We don't have a choice. Machine becomes our interpretation or numbers become our tools or senses. Okay. So, um, and that's why um, we will teach the libraries and make few reports that you can actually sh look at it and you will see that, oh, this makes sense, easy. It may take a couple of weeks, but at the end you would be able to talk about it yourself. Any other question? No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ravi, any questions? Uh, no, as of now, I don't have. Okay. Uh, once I'll uh, review this video and then I might get some doubts. Okay. Yeah, feel free to send me questions and I'll answer um, by, you know, recording video and I can think about it, what you are not uh, understanding. So my goal is not to just rush through everything that and leave everyone behind. Goal is to 
completely help you internalize these concepts and then apply effectively. Um, Neil? Yes, so far so good. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think soon we'll stop for today, but uh, let me think if I can miss anything. Chiranjeev, do you have any questions? Uh, as of now, no. I will come up with questions if I uh, face some. Right. right. So let me ramble on a little bit more and just talk about intuition because all the time show, showing formula and equation all the time you know, goes away from our intuition. We like to think visually. So if somebody also gives you, there are some data sets you will find and how to think about, I'll tell you. Those will be useful. You'll find a lot of data that have many columns. And I'll give you an example. It's about, say, marketing, right? So number of items procured, purchase. This is purchase, and this is, say, about different people's, my customer's data is pin number or address. Salary, gender, family size, family size, have children, likes movies, have a credit card. Have a Twitter account. Twitter is it active? Is active in Twitter. So you'll find state where which the, a pin number is fine enough. What state? Let's try and language. So you'll see that there are many variables, and this is definitely the y variable. It's called y variable, right? This is y. This is y. This is x1. You can call it x2, x3 x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, x9, x10, x11. Wow, 11. So your data set is going to look like a table. And essentially what you have is a, the x's, the x's, always write bold to, by writing twice. X11. So every data point has an X and a Y. Right? So now I want to talk about that. How would you train this data? Why is it Y? Purchase is something naturally Y because it is something you are trying to predict. I mean, if you already have a purchase data because you know all these users, but your goal is always to predict something unknown, not in your table. Somebody tells you that should I target the age group or if they have, if they are into like a, you know, movies or they have a credit card, what kind of people should I target as a data scientist, you would be asked. So this is where you may have to fit a model y equal to beta zero, beta one, beta two, uh, this is X1, this is X2, da, da, da. see, it's a long model. Now you have a problem here. I think one of them is called pin number. What is pin number doing here? How can I use it? As a data scientist, I'm going to throw it away. Sorry, I can't use it. I don't think it makes a difference because I have state. Even state is not a variable. I cannot write any formula. Out. Language, out. Likes movies, I can put zero, one, if you like. Children, I can put a number, family size, number. Gender, I'm sorry. Age, I'll keep. You see now, I've already eliminated some variables. Don't even include them. 
don't even use x11 so instead i will have i will think that i am going to give a simpler model uh, beta beta 2 is actually now x3 this is just a way of numbering them so x3 i'm going to use i'm not going to use x4 i'm going to use this family size then beta three. So, so you are going to fit a much smaller model. So as a data scientist, you guys should be able to make that decision for us. There is no one that has, somebody has to tell you. Just because somebody gave you data, you don't have to use it if it is not meaningful. So you should think independently that part. Do not become a machine. Just think independently if it makes sense or not. <clears throat> so that's how you start building a model. Then, because you have eliminated, you are left with much fewer variables, right? So you have eliminated one, two, three, four. So you have only seven now. From there, you might be able to remove some irrelevant ones. You can make seven scatter plots and make a judgment up front and keep the ones that you think are most meaningful. So there is no hard and fast rule. When you go for an interview and I was hiring for you, um, trying to interview you and you show me that hey I did scatter plot I did this it makes sense I'd be impressed I think that you can think independently you are not a machine you're a human being with intelligence so don't think that formula will always get you a data science you should show that you can think about it and then next day you can apply the right model Uh, I would like to ask you something. Sure. sure. Yeah, in the the one that you showed, there is a dependency between uh, X's and Y's. Uh, what if there is uh, interdependency between the variables itself? Like yes, X1 that's and a X2? very good question. And a lot of times that will bring us to something called dimensionality reduction. Because they have dependent on one another, there is a technique called dimensionality reduction. They will show that these things explain the same thing. For example, family size and number of children are very related. You can either justify as a data scientist that I'm going to keep only one of them, or there are techniques if you don't understand them. That's because we can interpret them. There are variables we cannot interpret. Then we do something called data reduction, dimension, dimensionality reduction, that will automatically reduce the dimension and keep the ones that are more explain more that's a very good question yeah and uh, does matrix will help us to uh, solve this problem by dimensionality reduction does matrix can help in solving it like yes so you there are some metrics we will talk about it how much how well a model is good AIC and BIC, there are two numbers we will calculate later, and they will tell you how good your model is, how well you fit a model. Because any model can be fit on any data almost. Is it useful? Those metrics will tell you. Any other question? Uh, Neil? Uh, so far, so good. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, what do you think, Neil, if we, um, sh if we should stop here for today or rethink some of the stuff and then redesign parts of it so that, you know, we address a lot of follow-up with the marketing example more detail? What do you think? Uh, no, I think we should stop it here for today. We should continue tomorrow. And uh, uh, No, I said that next week we will. Tomorrow we will we'll need some time to build all these tools, all these, uh, you know, uh, thing. I already announced in the, you know, beginning of the class. So we'll, there were all different kinds of uh, comments. Yeah, I think we should stop it for today. Tomorrow we should continue from here, uh, from this place itself, uh, where we have left today. Right. All right. Right, no, I'm saying that we will meet again next Saturday. Any questions you have, you send me emails and I'll record specifically videos and answer them. Okay, so let's uh, stop here today if you don't have any questions.
Okay. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there is tomorrow. There is no class. Uh, tomorrow there will not be any a class. So okay. I will directly uh, take questions and we'll meet again next Saturday. Okay. Okay. Sure. And one more request. So, uh, if possible, can you uh, share any kind of you know uh, notes or some? Uh, I, I will. Or, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.